In 2006, Timberland was under fire, faced with signs of scarcity as competitors from Skechers to Nike to Reebok went after what they called the brown shoe crowd and attacked Timberland's business. In 2006, during this time of crisis, Timberland had their annual sales conference of all places in New Orleans, Louisiana, one year after Hurricane Katrina. As is their style, they sacrificed the second day of the event to have community service because they realized it was the most important thing about their long-term success, interdependence. At the end of the first night, they brought in community leaders from New Orleans who shared powerful stories of the crisis that existed in that city and the need for companies to come together with governments and churches and civic groups and heal New Orleans. And it set the tone for the next day. On the second day, they walked three blocks downtown to Central City and they worked with local volunteers from City Year all day, helping Dookie Chase, the famous jazz musician, reopen his restaurant in Central City, devastated by the hurricane. All day long, they swung hammers, they painted, they hauled off garbage, they pounded nails, and they made a difference. And they were having a great time. Even Charles Barkley showed up with the media crew to observe and probably wager a little bit on the outcome. <laughs> One of the senior executives from Timberland, though, realized they were getting it wrong. Michelle Johnson saw this. She looked around and said, this is bucolic. This isn't real. We're a company playing nice in the safe part of town. These kids don't even know the half of it, she said. So she did something miraculous. She created what I call a ripple. She scared up three yellow school buses, a bullhorn, and a 25-year-old with a bad attitude and a knowledge of what had happened in the Ninth Ward. She loaded up these 200 Timberland salespeople, most of them raised in abundance. Most of them never seen anything like this. And those three yellow school buses rolled down the streets of the Ninth Ward, and they saw the real deal. They saw water lines 10 feet tall, buildings with no windows, a lawless place of danger, and they were not only afraid, they were hushed. The celebration turned into somber silence as they reflected on what little they had really done that day and how much we all have to make a difference in that city to get America right. So to punctuate this, at the end of the road, she pulls over the buses and tells these kids, just walk around for a few minutes and feel this, okay? And one of the young sales reps from, say, here to that coffee pot, right by the buses, notices a makeshift community center. And he knew it, despite its wavy wood roof and the fact that it looked like it could fall over, because there was a huge sign on the top announcing the next community meeting. And there was a volunteer outside with a clipboard counting water bottles. So the young man walked up and introduced himself. And he found out this was a volunteer. This was one of the community centers. And the volunteer explained to him that he and his family of five had been washed out of the Ninth Ward with Hurricane Katrina. And to that day, they were still living in a trailer about an hour outside of town that he explained smelled like rotten cabbage. The volunteer explained that he had no car, but when he could, he thumbed a ride into town a few days a week and gave everything he had and was passionate about finding more volunteers because he said, when you get the Ninth Ward in your blood, it's never over till it's over. And we're gonna fix this place by hook, he said, or by crook. This young man, a Dartmouth graduate who'd never seen anything like this, was moved, choked up. He asked this man, what can I do? He grabbed his shoulder and said, I work at a big company called Timberland. I can go home and I can write a memo. I can get you clipboards. I can get you pens. I can get you water bottles. What do you need? And he said that the volunteer looked at him and looked at the ground and smiled and said, son, we need boots. We need shoes. He said he looked down at the man's feet and for the first time noticed that his big toe was winking at him from his old beat-up tennis shoes. The volunteer said that the big easy flip-flops and sneakers worked before Katrina, but have you taken a look around you at this mess? Can you see the splinters? Do you see the glass? Do you see the nails? Do you see the screws? It's a war zone here for feet. Son, we need shoes. So in the moment, he got down on his hands and knees, and he unlaced his red Timberland boots that had been given to him in his sales contest two months before. And he handed his boots to the man and said, I can give you mine, and I'm gonna do it right now. He very cautiously made his way back to the bus, understanding for the first time what it would be like not to have shoes in the Ninth Ward. And when he got on the bus, he sat next to his boss who immediately noticed this kid wasn't wearing any shoes. I mean, at a Timberland conference, that would be highly inappropriate, don't you think? 
He said, son, where are those red boots? And the kid points over to the community center where you can plainly see them. And he says, can you believe it, coach? They don't have shoes or boots here. They need shoes. So I gave him mine. The boss says, that's the right way to see the world, kid. And as the boss stood up to get off the bus, 15 other Timberlanders on the bus that overheard the conversation squirted off the bus ahead of him to go give their shoes away to the Ninth Ward. And in an act of contagious compassion, the Responsibility Revolution broke out inside that group that day, and within 10 minutes, the buses were not running. And all 200 Timberland employees were off the bus, standing in line, single file, including the drivers, to give their shoes to the Ninth Ward. This volunteer was so choked up, all he could say was, God bless you and thank you, as he rushed to put the shoes together, keep the laces inside. He tried to organize them by side. He desperately borrowed his cell phone to call a friend and say, you got to get down here. We got shoes. And he knew that night they had to protect the booty because now he's going to get volunteers. There's a person in that group, the meeting planner, who was thoughtful enough on her cell phone to take a picture of the scene. She has shared it with me, and I bring it here today. Let's see this. This, my friends, this, my friends, is love. But when they loaded up on that bus, they weren't cheering, they weren't high-fiving, they were still crying and sobbing because they knew that all they'd done was given away a lousy pair of shoes and that would take their life to make the difference that was in their heart. But back at the hotel, things weren't so calm. You see, she emailed that picture back to one of her coworkers, and like some kind of scene out of the movie Pay It Forward, it hopped from cell phone to cell phone as the general manager and the catering manager and the AV crew and even guests that had nothing to do with the conference were caught up in the moment of contagious compassion. And when these 200 kids showed up at the hotel, the quietest bus ride of their life, they were stunned because they were greeted by 200 people, many of them strangers that hugged them and kissed them and thanked them for their act of compassion. And in their culture today, they call it a ripple, a single act of compassion that creates a chain reaction of love. My final question for you, if not you, then who? And if not right now, then when? Because together, Together, we will fix this world. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you.